You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Hey everybody, it's Brian McClanahan, and this is the Abbeville Week in Review for the week of December 14th through December 18th, 2015. Glad to be back. Got a lot to talk about this week. Coming at you a little, a little late, a day later than normal, but... Um, we got a lot to do, and uh, we got a great week coming up, too, uh, next week, week of Christmas, so a lot of fun stuff to uh, go over. Uh, before we get started, remember we have our conference in Charleston, South Carolina, February 26th and 27th, 2016, so make plans to be there. It's a really appropriate topic. The PC attack on the South, we saw this week that another attack was uh, leveled on the south by the city of New Orleans, which has decided in a city council vote to try to take down several monuments to the Confederacy, uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, the, the famous statue of Robert E. Lee included. Uh, and uh, I say try to take that down because now there's been a lawsuit filed. So uh, there are people fighting back. They're fighting back there. They're fighting back in Memphis. They're fighting back in Alabama. Lawsuits have been filed to uh, these state governments and city governments who are trying to take down monuments uh, that honor the, the South or, or the, uh, the Confederacy in particular. Uh, so there is an attempt to, uh, to, try to try to push back, but this is not going to stop. And uh, the really interesting thing about all of this from the beginning is that this is just, uh, I think when you look at this, if you study Reconstruction, the first attack on the South and the history of the South took place during Reconstruction, uh, during uh, the, the period uh, right after the war, but then continuing on into the 1870s and 80s, when there was an attempt to change Southern history. Northern history became the dominant history. Southern history was pushed, was, uh, pushed back. Uh, and so uh, one of the things we saw, very interestingly, by the 1930s, the first phase of this uh, cultural whitewashing of the South was the destruction of these old antebellum plantation homes. Uh, you saw a number of them just fade away by the 1930s and then were demolished. And this process has been going on now, here it is 2015, for a very long time. Uh, even the houses that survived the war, of course, many did not. But the ones that did, a lot of those were then uh, demolished or fell into disrepair and uh, were um, simply done away with. We actually have an article next week, we'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, this is just an ongoing process, uh, and it's not surprising. I mentioned last week in our Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute that even if the South does not have any symbols, even if the South loses all of its monuments, its statues, its flags, the Southern tradition is still there, and that's something we have to worry about uh, putting out there. This is a long war, and, and I tell people that all the time. The fight to save the Southern tradition in some ways uh, will have to carry on for a long period of time because uh, the progressives were able to do their damage, but it took them a long time. Uh, they started working on doing some of these things that have done that are now in effect in the United States, and take your take your pick in progressive legislation. But uh, progressivism was supposedly dead in the 1890s, and it came roaring back in the early 20th century, and then because of their idea of permeation, which is getting involved in civic organizations, getting involved in local politics and state politics. They were able to start pushing their message and eventually elected to the federal level and pushing their message there. And uh, one of the things they did well was in education. Uh, John Dewey, the father of progressive education, was able to emphasize that the schools were the place to begin because when you take these little children of mush and uh, these little minds of mush and you can teach them what you want to teach them, they become very good soldiers in your campaign to reform and remake America. Uh, and so uh, this is what we need to do. This is why the Abbey of Institute exists. It exists because we want to try to emphasize the real beneficial part of Southern history and the Southern tradition. And that's the Jeffersonian tradition. We're going to start our discussion of our articles this week with that. Uh, and so Jefferson was right in so many ways. Uh, Jefferson uh, understood what needed to happen for the United States to exist peacefully, for the United States to exist um, democratically, if you want to look at it that way, or if you want to look at it as a republic, a federal republic. He understood what needed to happen to ensure 
that the principles of 76 would not fade away. And this was recognized North and South, not just in the South, but the South carried this tradition longer than the North and, and uh, held on to it longer. Also, uh, December uh, 19th was the great John Taylor of Caroline's birthday. And uh, we have a number of articles on the website about John Taylor of Caroline. If you're not familiar with John Taylor of Caroline, you should be. He was the most principled of all the Jeffersonians. He rarely served in government. He, did, uh, he served in the U.S. Senate uh, in, the, in the federal government for a brief period of time. And he had a very interesting conversation when he was senator from Virginia. Uh, he was actually cornered by Rufus King and Oliver Ellsworth, both men who had served uh, in the Philadelphia Convention and then in their state ratifying conventions. Uh, King and Ellsworth cornered Taylor in a cloakroom in the Congress in 1794. So here we are five years after the Constitution has been ratified. And they pull him aside and say, look, John, this thing isn't working. You Virginians, you Southerners are blocking everything we're trying to do. So why don't we just uh, talk about separating now? Uh, The union isn't working. Uh, We need to get out of this union. And so here we are in 1794. You have Northerners talking about secession. And it must always be emphasized that secession, the principle of secession, was actually advocated first in the North not the South. It's just the South that had the backbone to pull it off in 1860 and 1861. But you look at when secession was first discussed. It was discussed in 1794 in the North. It was discussed in 1800 in the North. It was discussed in 1803 in the North. It was discussed in 1815 in the North. All uh, by men who had served in the Philadelphia Convention in the highest levels of the federal government and their state ratifying conventions, they were all convinced in the North that secession was entirely legal. Even the great Daniel Webster from Massachusetts, and I say great because he's considered one of the great triumvirate of uh, Webster, Clay, and Calhoun, when he was a young member of the House of Representatives from Massachusetts, he advocated secession. Uh, And the Hartford Convention, he, he went to the Hartford Convention. Now, Uh, He actually made a statement in 1812 in a speech that uh, he believed that secession was entirely legal and right if northern rights would not be maintained at that time. And this is the general concept of the Union that everyone in the founding generation had that was the American concept of the Union or conception of the Union all the way up until uh, really 1860 and 61. I think in some ways southerners were surprised the about the amount of vitriol and then of course the attack that came on them when they did secede from the union because this had been recognized as something that could be done throughout the antebellum period Uh, northern abolitionists had talked about secession over and over again for the north not for the south uh, because they thought that was the only way to preserve a non-slaveholding republic was to have secession and so when southerners actually did it they were surprised at the response. And uh, I think that um, when you look at the Upper South, in particular Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, these areas were definitely surprised that Lincoln would call up uh, the number of troops that he did to go and invade the South, and that's why they ended up leaving the Union after they had already rejected secession, or at least said that uh, they were not going to secede at one point. So, the great John Taylor of Caroline, the great old Republican Uh, As I said, we have a number of articles about John Taylor of Caroline uh, on the website. Uh, If you you don't want to read a a brief article about his political philosophy, we actually had a series by uh, Joe Stromberg on the website about John Taylor of Caroline. If you don't want to read that, you can read him yourself. Almost all of his books are available for free online. Uh, But um, he had a wonderful book about the Constitution uh, that was written in response to John Adams's uh, book about the Constitution, his views, uh, uh, Taylor's views of the Constitution of the United States. And of course, Taylor, along with Tucker, St. George Tucker, are really the best two uh, early proponents of this uh, view of the Constitution, which has now been considered the Southern view of the Constitution, but at the time was really the, the view of the Constitution, that it was a compact between states and that these states uh, were sovereign in this political uh, union. And uh, we have to remember it was a union of states, not a union of individuals. So if you can, if you can get that point, 
if you can get that point and hammer that point home, this is something that you know, the Institute really tries to do with all kinds of issues. This, this works north, south, uh, works for the left, it works for the right. Uh, this is not something that is uh, simply confined to, a, confined to people on the right where it will work. Um, will work for all kinds of issues. This Jeffersonian idea of federalism, that that's what we need to push because that is now what is considered the Southern tradition, the political tradition anyways, and we can talk about the Southern tradition in terms of culture and the arts, but the political tradition in the South is definitely that, that idea of real federalism that uh, Jefferson was, uh, was the true exponent of and the most famous exponent of. Of course, uh, Taylor, as I said, was more principled than Jefferson himself. Now, let's talk about the stuff that we had for December 14th through the 18th, a week in review at the Abbey Hill Institute. So we started this week with a, actually an article by Dave Benner, uh, who's from Minnesota. Uh, we've, we've, had, uh, we've discussed Dave Benner before, and uh, his first article uh, was entitled, Jefferson Was Right. And um, the, uh, the article simply gets into the fact that, look, that there was an a op-ed piece in a... Um, a northern newspaper, uh, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, which had said, um, history proves Thomas Jefferson was wrong. Phew! So Benner responds that, no, sir, Jefferson was actually right. Uh, and uh, Jefferson did support the Constitution with the Bill of Rights because he thought that this would be the best way to rein in the federal government. Of course, I think you can say that Southerners had too much faith in the Tenth Amendment. Uh, there was no, there's no mechanism for enforcement in the Tenth Amendment. That, that's where you do have some problems with the Tenth. And you've got, of course, the Tenth Amendment Center, which is doing a lot of great work. Uh, Michael Bolden out of Los Angeles. It's, it's interesting. Here we are. Uh, this, this is really being pushed in Los Angeles. But you've got the Tenth Amendment Center doing great work. If you've never checked them out, uh, go to the Tenth Amendment Center uh, .org. Uh, but uh, and you have this Tenth Amendment movement is really catching on. And so Jefferson and others in the South believed that the Tenth Amendment would be the way to check the federal government. Um, of course, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, both supported a Tenth Amendment position. And this is where Benner is saying Jefferson was right. Uh, Jefferson was right in his advocacy of the Tenth Amendment and how that would really save the issues of the day. You know, nowadays, take, take any issue, whether it's same-sex marriage, we saw how the states tried to push back there. And there still is an attempt to do this. It hasn't gone away, but the states are pushing back. Now, federal judges don't like that particular idea, so they work against it. However, uh, in places like Colorado and Washington State, there's been a pushback against federal drug legislation. And so you have these states decriminalizing marijuana, and the federal government has done nothing about it. The states are pushing back on immigration. There are a number of issues out there where the states could, if they would just develop a backbone, resist. And uh, this is something that we should be doing, resisting through the idea of the Tenth Amendment, and that's where Jefferson was right, uh, and realistically in the Southern tradition. Now, Tuesday, uh, we ran a, a piece that was a speech presented in 1876 by Daniel Harvey Hill, D.H. Hill, who was one of Lee's lieutenants. If you've read Douglas Southall Freeman's three-volume Lee's lieutenants, Hill uh, does have a spot in the book. Of course, he didn't always see eye-to-eye eye eye with Lee, and that may have uh, damaged his reputation a bit. Uh, but um, the title of this piece is, We Want Nas Not Gascons, But Southern Gentlemen, Honorable, High-Toned Men of Strict Integrity and Straight Hair. And um, the interesting thing about this piece, and why I like it in particular, and it was delivered uh, in a speech in Mecklenburg, uh, North Carolina, uh, but what Hill is doing here is essentially what the Institute stands for. And he starts looking at how important the South was to the fabric of America, how the South really is America. He even points out that the Union war effort 
would have been impossible. It would have been impossible to defeat the South had not Southerners supported the Union. And he points out that some of the greatest Union generals were, in fact, Southerners. That the North was bungling along, and then they had Southerners at various times bail them out. Uh, these men who had served. Uh, and so he talks about how Southern history really was American history. He does say something I think is um, interesting about the South and its and its uh, its economy. Uh, he says it is true that the great thinkers of the world have generally been born and reared in the country. But it is equally true that they did not become distinguished until their minds had received the uh, attrition of town life. Plotting, painstaking historians, hardworking students of science, enthusiastic, enthusiastic devotees to the arts are not found in the rural districts. The free, fresh air of the country is unfavorable to all that sort of thing. Literary and scientific men, if not born in great centuries of trade and commerce, go there to meet congenial spirits or to find the the appliances of their art. The South, he says, has no has had no literature and no science. No, I disagree with this. Uh, this is one part of the piece that I disagree with. I think if you look at uh, the great thinkers that came out of the South, there are many of them. Uh, Charles Francis Murray, uh, the um, great scientist of the seas, was a Southerner. If you look at Southern literature, Edgar Allan Poe, William Gilmore Sims and Henry Timrod and all the great names in the Southeast were agricultural men. Sims, most importantly, his plantation Woodlawn, uh, was the greatest writer in the South. And some people sneer at them, and you see it uh, even after, well, of course, after the war, they're going to sneer at them. At the time, Sims was widely read in the North, before the war, until he wrote the anti-Uncle Tom's Cabin pieces, but widely read in the North. Uh, and he loved his plantation. And so science, just, uh, you know, John Taylor of Caroline, who I already mentioned, his Erator, uh, which was in some ways the first scientific treatise in the South about agriculture, and agriculture was a science. It wasn't just simply going out and plowing up the land and putting some seeds in. These men had to figure out how to make it work in a plantation society and have high crop yield. And so science was important to these men. So to say that the South really had no interest in science uh, is, uh, is wrong. You have Murray, you have Sims, uh, T Taylor. Um, so I, I disagree with him there. But he says that because the South is agriculture, and I think he's looking back at Sparta, he, he's comparing uh, his, Sparta is on his mind. Because if you look at Sparta and Athens in Greek history and uh, of course, Basil Gildersleeve, who's one of the great thinkers of the post-bellum period for the South, who taught at Johns Hopkins and uh, was a great classicist, perhaps the greatest classicist in the United States at the time. Uh, but when you look at Athens and Sparta, uh, you, you find that Sparta provided the muscle and Athens the mind, Sparta being the agricultural entity and, and Athens being the commercial entity. And so he's saying that uh, the South will always provide men of either either statesmen or soldiers because of the agricultural uh, nature of the South. So he says, has the South succeeded in furnishing brave soldiers and statesmen? And why statesmen? And then he goes through the fact that you begin with the American War for Independence and Washington, of course, is the greatest Southern statesman and the greatest soldier that South Carolina provided, Sumter and Marion and Pickens. If you go to the War of 1812, the War of 1812 was uh, distinguished by Southerners, of course, Andrew Jackson being the most famous. Uh, go back to the American War for Independence, and he, he does mention George Rogers Clark, uh, who brought the West to the United States. Uh, so you look at all the great Southerners you served, during the war with Mexico, the War of 1812. Uh, 
You look at all the great names that served in the Southern War for Independence, both North and South. And he mentions the fact that Lincoln, in fact, was born in the South. So, uh, both, South, both Lincoln and Davis born in the South. And he says, next to Grant and Sherman, the most successful federal generals who struck us the heaviest blows were born in the South. Thomas, Canby, Blair, Sykes, Ord, Getty, Anderson, Alexander, Nelson. If it wasn't for them, the North wouldn't have won the war. Farragut, Tennessee, of course, the great uh, Union naval officer. And he says, had the South been united, our independence could easily have been established. But unfortunately, the South furnished probably as many native troops of the Federal Army as of the vast, pop vast and populous North. He talks about the South. This is, this is actually a very important point to make. And this is why the North didn't like the South. From Washington's inauguration to Grant's, the Republic had lasted, after a fashion, 80 years. Then a new element of voting power was introduced, not known to the framers of the Constitution. And I therefore only estimate the time up to this radical change. Of the 80 years, 57 were passed under the presidents of southern-born men, and but 23 under northern presidents. Up to 23 years under northern presidents, John and John Quincy Adams, Van Buren, Pierce, and Buchanan, each served each four years in Fillmore Three. The second Adams was not the choice of the people and was elected by the House of Representatives. Mr. Fillmore was elevated by the death of President Taylor. So up to the period of this new kind of voting, the people had really never elected but four northern men to the presidency. He's talking about, of course, wider suffrage in the South. It is remarkable, too, that the people have repudiated the administration of every northern president, not one of them being re-elected, and a different political party always succeeding them in power, save in the case of Mr. Pierce, a Democrat, who was succeeded by Mr. Buchanan, also a Democrat. On the other hand, five southern presidents were re-elected, and all of them were succeeded by presidents of the same political faith, except perhaps Mr. Polk, who was succeeded by General Taylor, running upon a no-party platform. On the other hand, I'm sorry, the country endorsed Polk's administration and did not repudiate him as he declined a renomination. Another curious fact is this, that every northern president had associated with him a southern man as vice president. Thus, John Adams had Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams had John C. Calhoun, Martin Van Buren had R.M. Johnson, Pierce had William Rufus King, Buchanan had John C. Breckinridge. On the other hand, Jackson served one term with John C. Calhoun, Harrison and Tyler, his associate, were both from Virginia, and Lincoln and Johnson were both from the South. Of these same 80 years, the South had a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court bench for 63 years, or more than three-fourths of the time. The purity and wisdom of these Southern justices made them the pride of the nation. All the acquisitions of territory have been under Southern presidents, by which the size of the United States have been doubled. Louisiana, Florida, Texas, New Mexico, California, and Alaska. The New England states resisted all these acquisitions except the last. The political studies of the South all led to freedom, and Southern statesmen have always been on the side of popular rights. So he points out that it would not for the South, we wouldn't have the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. So uh, the South, he says, is so important to the fabric of the United States. He also says that the world has never seen finer fighting material than our own ragged rebels. They united the Elan of the Frenchman with the dogged obstinacy of the Englishman. The careless gaiety of the Italian with the uncomplaining uncom un fortitude of the Russian. How cheerfully they bore hunger, thirst, heat, cold, and all wretchedness. And how magnificently they moved forward under the storm of shot and shell. What he calls for at the end of this piece, and that's the title of the piece. He says, We trust that the time may not be far distant when the influence of southern statesmanship will be felt in the councils of the nation, rebuking bribery and roguery, elevating the public morals and purifying the government. 
To these, to effect these great objects, we must send forward our best men, not fire eaters and braggarts. We confess that we have had a few of that class, but hot shot and shell reversing the order of nature cooled their fiery temperaments. And if you don't know what a Gascon is, a Gascon is from French, and they were considered boasting men. And that's why he says we need, we need good men of the South to lead, because when good men of the South lead, the United States is better off for it. And if you look at all the things going on in the United States today, it's generally the South that's resisted some of the nasty elements the best. And um, as the South, this is why uh, you know people say, you know, the better off in the North, we're better off without them. Uh, Lois Lerner of the, the, the IRS said, look, it'd be better if Lincoln didn't invade the South and the South just was able to go in peace because... We'd be better off without them. Uh, and so Southerners, I mean, this is where it's funny because Southerners, well, we tried that. You know, you didn't let us go. And I, I don't think the North can let the South go because there would be no whipping boy. There'd be no one to point out and say, well, you know, uh, all the bad things are because of the South. We just we just didn't have the South. Uh, you know, things would be better. But we're never going to let them go because then we wouldn't have anybody to complain about. So this theme of, of uh, the South being important, this Jeffersonian tradition, D.H. Hill says that, Dave Benner says that, and then we ran a piece on Wednesday at the Clyde Wilson Library, the Jeffersonian Democrat rediscovered. This is from a book review he wrote in 1976, early in his career, uh, on uh, a Robert Whitaker book, a play, a review of, it's a review of a plague of, on both your houses. And Robert Whitaker uh, is an interesting fellow, uh, Eccentric is a nice way to put it. Uh, he he um, uh, wrote uh, an edited collection of essays entitled The New Right Papers, which was pretty good. Clyde had contributed to that. And uh, years ago, I wrote a piece for uh, LewRockwell.com where I talked about the Robert W. Whitaker effect, and the title of that piece was Vote Obama. Whitaker believes that if you really want to affect change, if there is a decision between a moderate Republican and a liberal Democrat, or a moderate and a liberal, doesn't matter, party affiliation, but a moderate and a liberal. You vote for the liberal because you're going to get to where you're going fast, or the moderate will get you there slowly. We just saw this, and we're seeing it right now play out in the, in the stupid party GOP nominating process for president. We've got the, what's now called the establishment. It's the neoconservatives, but the establishment. People like Jeb Bush, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and people of that nature. Uh, and uh, they're... They're being confronted by people like Trump and uh, Rand Paul uh, and Ted Cruz. So you've got this real split in the Republican Party. Now Trump, we can talk about you know his credentials and but he is he is an outsider. He's non-establishment. He says all the right things and he knows how to use the media to his advantage. And so this is what we're seeing now. It's been going on for a very long time. Whitaker was talking about it back in the seventies how you had this fusion of the two parties and really the people are unrepresented. You know, Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, the, the last budget deal. I mean, people could see this coming if you know who Paul Ryan is. This has been pointed out over and over again, and people are shocked. Oh, my gosh, Paul Ryan betrayed us. Well, he's just going along with what he's always done. Uh, and so this is just this is to say that you have – this particular issue, this unification of the two parties, which is really just one party, the Republicans, they're all nationalists. They all believe in this one-size-fits-all uh, stand on the Constitution, whether it's their issues or the other side's issues. They don't care. It's all about federal power. They don't really believe in federalism at all, and the states having any authority and that we should return things back to the states. They believe in the central government being supreme and being able to do whatever it wants to do, uh, and so what we need and what Clyde had said back in 1976, what Robert Whitaker had said back in 1976, and here we are leading into the point where you're going to have Jimmy Carter as president. You're going to have, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan in 1980 and 81. And this is why Reagan, I mean, of course, remember 1976, Reagan ran uh, against Gerald Ford and almost got the nomination in 76 because he spoke like a Jeffersonian Democrat. This is exactly what Donald Trump is doing right now. It's that blue-collar, working-class coalition 
That's what Jimmy Carter was actually able to tap into in 76. He's an outsider. He's a peanut farmer from Georgia. He's not one of these establishment Democrats. I mean, if you look at the Democrat uh, situation right now in 2000, going into the 2016 election, Bernie Sanders is having a lot of traction because he's the outsider. He's not the establishment. He's not Hillary Clinton, in other words. You know, Hillary Clinton is the establishment. Bernie Sanders is still the establishment, but he's from you know, the deep north. He's a socialist. He's kind of hip, uh, and he's this outsider kind of candidate. It's exactly what Donald Trump is. So I think the majority of Americans, whether on, on the left or the right, realize that the establishment does not work for them. The establishment is the problem. Uh, now, Sanders still believes in a one-size-fits-all policy. You have a strong central government that just destroys the states. So he's, he's terrible in that way. But he is someone who is not the establishment, so to speak, like a Hillary Clinton. Uh, this is why people in, uh, in the Republican Party are talking about, well, if Trump gets the nomination, we're just going to throw our money behind Clinton because she's exactly one of us. And she really is. Uh, she's, she's definitely one of them. All right, so... Um, Clyde says, hardly has anyone commented upon the seemingly seeming disappearance from American life of the Jeffersonian Democrat. The Jeffersonian Democrat was a hardy American breed, perhaps the only political type original to this continent. Outnumbering all other species between 1800 and 1861, he was a numerous beast long afterward and was spotted quite often even as late as the 1940s. Since then, he seems to have disappeared, if not into extinction, at least out of the official catalogs. The disappearance is not surprising. Jeffersonian Democrats, since their first discovery in colonial America, have never enjoyed academic or media respectability. And you see that now. <clears throat> so, what Clyde was seeing in the 1970s, in the middle of the 70s, was this kind of populist uprising. Uh, he says, in the American locus, Jeffersonian democracy has been the traditional faith of the producing majority. Therefore, the term seems to be a better one than populist, an elastic application long ago robbed of uh, denotive content by conservative conservatives raising the alarm against imaginary boogeyman and liberals attempting to co-op an affiliation with the people to which they have no honest claim. Jeffersonian democracy divides the political world into producers and aristocrats. The last a technical term not suggesting any of the virtues traditionally associated with aristocrats, or aristocracies, I should say. Producers are those who do their biblical labor in the vineyards and add something to the total store of wealth of the community. A producer was synonymous with a good citizen and a true republican in the glossary of the founding fathers. An aristocrat, in contradiction, is one who lives by unearned privilege or clever maneuver, who profits by some artificial special advantage at the expense of the producers. A Jeffersonian Democrat, he says, or a populist, is not a prog prog uh, programmatic utopian or egalitarian at all. He is one who normally goes quietly about his business. He is, in fact, an American Tory, swearing no allegiance except to king, that is, constitution, and country. He's propelled into action only by an acute sense of outrage when the aristocrats become too reckless, and so he needs to work to action. And this is what's happening now. This is the outsider image of Donald Trump. The establishment has become very reckless. And so you have Trump coming in, blazing in, saying we're gonna, he's, a, he's got a baseball bat, he's wrecking the China shop. This is why people are attracted to him, because the Jeffersonian idea is still out there. We need to rein in these guys in government, and the only way to do it, really, I mean, if you look at the only real way to do it is through federalism, Trump won't be able to do it. No one will in Washington, D.C. But uh, they come riding in, and that rhetoric, and you see it. Ronald Reagan, actually, and Jimmy Carter both spoke this way. Reagan was seen as an outsider. Gerald Ford was the establishment, the Rockefeller-type Republicans. Reagan came riding in to save the day. Jimmy Carter, same thing in 1976. He spoke the exact same way. Clyde goes on to say, the common American is a conservative and a Democrat because he is the traditional American and because he acts in self-defense, not from ideology. 
The common American is no enemy of religion, tradition, or private property. In fact, he may be the only numerous group left in the world who can trust it with these things. Clyde goes on to conclude, Out there, south and west of the Hudson, in the sprawling suburbs, towns, and farms of the great millions of at least potential populace, they are the American nation. They do the work. It is they who will defend the republic if it is to be defended against the foreign enemy. It is their hopeful homes and unfulfilled ambitions that are the great reservoir of talents that are needed to reinvigorate the arts, sciences, and, sciences and professions in each generation. They sustain the values that make communal existence possible. Right now, as Mr. Whitaker so eloquently specifies, they are beleaguered. They are still beleaguered. And this is 1976, almost 40 years ago. They were beleaguered then. They're still beleaguered. But when you can tap into them, they come out in large numbers. This is where the establishment can't figure this out because they've lost Jeffersonian democracy. They've lost the Jeffersonian tradition. This is why they, they're perplexed. I mean, what is going on here, they think? And so the piece we published on Thursday really carries that theme, that theme forward. It's, the title was A Wisconsin Copperhead by uh, John Battelle, and John Battelle is a retired school teacher in, in Wisconsin uh, and a pastor. And uh, the reason this piece is interesting, it's, it's about northern resistance to Lincoln in Wisconsin during the war. These were the Jeffersonian Democrats. This is where Jefferson was right. These people were saying, look, what you've done, Mr. Lincoln, is perverted Jeffersonianism, you perverted the real union. You've changed it. And so uh, you had large numbers of Northerners in our, our book that we published with the Abbeville Institute Press, Northern Opposition to Mr. Lincoln's War. We had a conference on it in Stone Mountain, Georgia in 2012, which produced the book, uh, which is available at Amazon.com. Uh, and so you go out there and pick up a copy. Make a great Christmas gift, by the way. you got a few days left for Christmas. Uh, so go pick up a copy of Northern Opposition to Mr. Lincoln's War. Uh, and it talks about these people were just simply the Jeffersonians saying what you've done here is ruin the true nature of the Union by invading the South. And so Mr. Battelle has gone out and uh, quoted a number of editorials in Wisconsin newspapers, uh, the... the uh, man he cites more often is Marcus Mills Pomeroy, who edited a Wisconsin newspaper called The Daily Democrat. And he talks about how Pomeroy um, was really vehemently attacking Abraham Lincoln. And this was a very manly thing to do in the 1860s. You, you didn't do this lightly because people could be thrown in jail for this. Uh, you saw it all over the North. Newspapers were shut down. People were fined. People were thrown in jail uh, because habeas corpus had been su uh, suspended. People were booted out of the U.S. Congress because of their opposition to the war. He calls, uh, Pomeroy calls Abraham Lincoln the widowmaker. He says, look at the picture of Abraham Lincoln, the widowmaker, who swore to support the constitution of the country and has broken his oath and disregarded his vows oftener than any man living. He was the pillar of fire which was led, led us from troubles of rebellion. He was the brain which comprehended the situation. His were the lips which said that no one would be hurt. His was the plan which would save the country and capture Rip, Richmond. We want people to look upon his face, to read his history, to obtain the record of his acts, to acquaint themselves with his ability to weep over the homes he has made desolate to gaze upon the army of crippled and maimed men he is sending home to take the places of the perfect ones he called away, to count the widows he has made by its clownish blunderings, to look at the city police records of girls forced into houses of prostitution to escape starvation, to count, if figures will do it, the millions of orphans he has made to groan and toil and sweat under the taxation his hell-born administration has entailed upon the land, and then shout in joy. Hurrah for Abraham Lincoln, the widowmaker of the 19th century. Don't he look well? Is not his picture perfect, made either with pen or pencil? This is not what you hear in your modern history textbooks. I mean, 
lip service is given to the opposition, but these people were just crazy in these textbooks. They, the vast minority, they, they didn't know what they were doing. Pomeroy also said, the man who votes for Lincoln now is a traitor and a murderer. He who, pretending to war for wars against the constitution of our country, is a traitor. And Lincoln is one of these men. Calling Lincoln a traitor. And if you look at the definition of treason in the constitution, Lincoln fit. Because treason is defined as waging war against them, which is the states. If Lincoln is saying that the union is still intact, he's waging war against the states. Pomeroy was no slaveholder. He, he now he he recoiled at radical abolition, but he, he didn't support slavery. Uh, and most Northerners didn't that oppose Lincoln. They opposed him on principle for what he was doing to the Constitution and the Union, and going to war, which they said was illegal. When Lincoln was up for re-election, Pomeroy said, Battel said, Pomeroy said, May Almighty God forbid that we ha are to have two terms of the rottenest, most stinking, ruin-working smallpox ever conceived by friends or mortals in the shape of two terms of Abe Lincoln's administration. And he later said, The people do not want this war. Taxpayers do not wish it. Widows, orphans, and overtaxed working men do not ask or need this waste of men, blood, and treasure. There was no glory to be won in a civil war, no more than in a family quarrel. If politicians would let this matter come before the people, there would be an honorable peace within 60 days. But so long as blind leaders govern and fanaticism rules the day, so long will there be war, tears, and desolation. It might be treason to write this, but we cannot help it. If the truth be treason, this is the height of it. But such treason will find a cordial amen in thousands of hearts, both in and out of of the army. If truth be treason, then we need to make sure we speak the truth. Again, we speak the truth at the Abbeville Institute. So this is the Jeffersonian tradition. All Pomeroy is doing is articulating it in Wisconsin in 1864 before Lincoln was re-elected, saying we don't need this. And our final piece for the week was by uh, John Marcourt, south from Egypt. Uh, Egypt, he's not referring to the country of Egypt, but to a part of Illinois known as Egypt, or Little Egypt. It's places like Cairo, and Karnak, and Thebes, he says Egypt was defi or definitely pro-Southern territory in the 19th century, with the majority of the area settlers having migrated there from various Southern states, and many of them having uh, brought their slaves with them. Even though Illinois had been admitted to the Union as a free state in 1818, an exception was granted to those who had owned slaves or who had employed indentured servants prior to statehood, most of whom were in Egypt, where many worked in the area's coal and salt mines. So he mentions that uh, Illinois was, parts of Illinois, the southern part of Illinois in particular, was very southern, and that uh, Lincoln, in fact, had tried to court these people while he was running for office. Um, and he mentions that uh, Illinois was not always sympathetic to the plight of black Americans, that there were laws in Illinois against black Americans even settling in the state or living in the state, uh, they were called the Black Laws. Uh, he says, under these laws, the rights of all African Americans in the state were severely restricted. They could not vote, bring an action, or testify against a white person in court, gather in groups of more than three persons, serve in the state militia, or possess firearms. Furthermore, if a person of color failed to carry an official certificate of freedom, he or she would be considered a runaway slave and treated as such. The laws also ruled that no free black person from another state would be allowed to remain in Illinois for more than 10 days, and if they did so, they would be subject to arrest, a $50 fine and deportation. And when I give my talk in Charleston, I'm going to talk about this a little bit uh, in, in the speech of tear down monuments of slavery in the North. So 
he mentions that the fact that this part of Egypt had long been a, a center of anti-Lincoln sentiment, even though Illinois is the land of Lincoln, it wasn't unified in that way. And this is this, these pieces, uh, south from Egypt and also the Wisconsin Copperhead, complement each other nicely because they point out that the North was not unified. These were these were Jeffersonian Democrats in these areas that were against uh, this type of activity. So a lot of the Copperheads of the Peace Democrats came from this part of Illinois. Then he says, move the calendar ahead to the next century of another Egyptian who also found his place in the South, the author Stanley Preston Kimmel from Perry County in the upper tier of Egypt's counties. He was born in 1894, studied at uh, the University of Southern California, went to Europe to serve in World War I, uh, served in the Navy, But Kimmel, of course, wrote a number of books on the war. And uh, both of these are entitled Mr. Lincoln's Washington and Mr. Davis's Richmond. Uh, Mr. Marquardt says the two books each contained a highly accurate and extremely even-handed description of the events and protagonists in both cities during the war between the states, as well as a massive number of rare photographs from the period. At the time of their publication over a half century ago, while neither book attained the status of Kimmel's previous studies of the Booths, they reach widely acclaimed by both the general public and wartime historians. So uh, Kimmel, I didn't mention this, but Kimmel also wrote uh, The Mad Booths of Maryland, uh, which was a study of the Booth family. So Mr. Marquardt says, concludes, What makes Kimmel's three books about 19th century America so relevant now is the simple fact that the author never allowed himself to become bogged down with the heavy baggage of political correctness. Kimmel always approached his subjects with an eye to contemporary history and in the context of the period in which such events actually took place, rather than attempting to fit them into present-day mores. Furthermore, he always tried to describe the events on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line as they might have been witnessed by the people of that period, not as people currently prefer to view them. On Kimmel's literary stage, there appeared many true heroes dressed in both Confederate gray and Union blue, each proudly waving on high their nation's banners, would that the theater of, t of today allowed such balanced performances? And it won't. We see it. This is the PC attack on the South, and we must emphasize it. The PC attack on the South is not just an attack on the South. It's an attack on what made America. If you believe in, the, in America, then you really do believe in the Southern tradition. You believe in Jefferson. You believe in Jeffersonian America. If you believe in America, the people that are out denouncing that, don't really believe in America. America was not a proposition nation, and that's the distortion of Jefferson. But that real federalism, that is the American political tradition that the South held on to. And if you look at what made, and this is where I talked about John Shelton Reed a couple of weeks ago, um, the same old stand and how this individualism had been brought out of the South. That is the Southern tradition. Of course, you look at the arts and how many Southerners were so important in the arts in America where I would disagree with Hill about that. Hill did write a very funny book about mathematics where he uh, used word problems that <laughs> subtly attacked the North and, and Northerners, Yankees. But if you believe in that Southern tradition, if you want to continue to support that, please support the Abbeville Institute and in our efforts to do this, make this podcast possible, to make our website possible, to make our programs possible, all the things we do, are there because of generous contributions from you. Your donations are tax-deductible to the full extent of the law. They help keep the lights on. Go to www.abbevilleinstitute.org. We are at the end of 2015. Get your donation in now for your 2015 taxes. Renew your membership for 2016. Please consider doing that. We have a number of membership levels. So uh, consider con uh giving a contribution to the Abbeville Institute, come to our conferences, Charleston, South Carolina, February. We're going to have two more at least next year after that, uh, and there will be more information about that forthcoming. Support our mission to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Uh, we want to be the voice for that in not just the South, but in America, because this is so valuable. I mean, people, when they hear the Southern tradition, they hear what, what it really is and what it can be and what it can provide to America. They, they're attracted to it. It's the counterweight to everything going on in America today. 
Until next time, good day.